holiday in Korea. Did you know that most Koreans take three days off for Chuseok? It's the day where the Korean, the agrarian people that we are, thanked our ancestors for the year's harvest and shared their abundance with their family and friends. And in the spirit of Chuseok, it's very important that we here in the U.S., Korean Americans, appreciate that tradition. And I'm going to talk today a little bit about what I think that tradition means and how to make sure that the children, that my parents worked so hard and your parents worked so hard to succeed, can continue to succeed here in the U.S. My speech is entitled, uh, Breaking the Bamboo Seal. It's really named after a book by another Korean-American friend by the name of Jane Hun. She wrote a book basically about the glass ceiling that Asian-Americans face in professional and corporate life. And what I would like to talk about today is the glass ceiling that I had to break in order to get to my position and the glass ceiling that your children will absolutely face in corporate America, which have to be broken. So my background goes something like this. It's a classic Korean-American story. Right? I was 10 years old when my parents uh, immigrated to the U.S. Um, I grew up right down the turnpike, uh, exit 4, Cherry Hill, right along with my um, two siblings who came with me. We were seven and four when they came. I grew up in a very non-diverse environment. Uh, there were very few Koreans in Cherry Hill and the surrounding neighborhood. The only other Koreans that I knew were my two best friends who were sitting here right here. Who uh, grew up in two towns over. And the three of us grew up together knowing the only Koreans we knew as a teenager. It was tough growing up. Um, my parents worked really hard, I said. They ran a grocery store, restaurant, diner, you name it. And uh, I ran many other businesses because my parents didn't speak English. Um, I remember one time that uh, my three-year-old that might had to be locked up inside the apartment because my sister and I would go to school at about 8 o'clock. And my parents, who worked the night shift, weren't home until 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. So he was locked up inside so that he couldn't get out by himself. And of course, when uh, my parents would come home and see my, uh, my, my uh, brother John, he would be crying the whole time. And I have a distinct memory of that. Um, it turned out OK. Um, <laughs> he went to Harvard, graduated uh, from Wharton Business School, and uh, became the CFO of an uh, investment bank, and is now the CEO of a private equity fund. So in the scheme of things, they did okay. The only problem is actually when he goes into an elevator, <laughs> he gets claustrophobic. I don't know why. My sister went to University of Penn and graduated there and, and married a doctor, and she had the best life because she doesn't have to work for a living. <laughs> um, Unlike my two siblings, I did not go to an Ivy League undergrad. In 1979, the year I graduated from Cherry Hill West, the druggiest high school in the suburbs of Philadelphia in 1979, I got a letter from the University of Pennsylvania saying I got admitted to Penn. Now, for those of you who lived in the Philadelphia area for a long time, you know how great of a school that most Korean Americans view Penance, right? It's God's gift to college students. And um, I got into a couple other Ivy League colleges, but despite my parents' wishes, I did not go to Penn. I went to a small liberal arts college called Haverford College. And my parents were so embarrassed by that college, they would say it really fast, because if you say Haverford really fast, it goes like this, Harvard. <laughs> He goes to <laughs> Eventually, my parents came around, and they became very, very proud 
of a Haverford alumnus. It's at Haverford. I read, I learned how to read, how to think, how to speak, how to write. Four things you must learn no matter what profession you're in if you're going to succeed in that profession. And in a small liberal arts college environment, that's what I learned. At Haverford, I studied philosophy and religion. I wanted to be a minister. Uh, I went like a good Korean boy. I went to church as a kid. And I wanted to be a minister. But um, one of my friends said to me, Don, you love sin too much. You can't be a minister if you love sin all the time. Good point. So I went to law school. <laughs> I don't even have to do law school jokes, right? I, mean, I went to law school to do public interest work, to do community work. That's what I wanted to do. But when I graduated from Columbia Law School, I had a hundred thousand dollar loan, and I said I really can't do much good until I pay off my loan. So I went to Wall Street and became Merchants and Acquisitions lawyer. I remember one day I was in my office, uh, a colleague of mine came to me and said, Don, you're very lucky. You're an Asian guy, and all Asians are smart. I said, I don't think you know me that well. <laughs> what he really meant was, Asian Americans have a stereotype of being smart, and you're lucky to have that. And I felt, at first that sounds like a good idea. But in the long run, I will tell you, that is not a good stereotype. And I'll explain later what, what that meant. But eventually, a recruiter took me away from a law firm to go in-house and eventually became, uh, I wasn't the first general counsel of Fortune 500, but at the time I was the only one. There was another guy who preceded me. His name is Raymond Ocampo, who was a friend of mine. He was, at that time, before me, general counsel of a little company called Oracle. And he retired at the age of 42. And when I became general counsel and I was looking for advice from him, the only thing that mattered to him was the Latin dancing class that he had to go the next day. <laughs> so, but I became the general counsel of Fortune 500 called Icon, and it is at that point I learned a little bit about why there were so few Asian Americans in the C-suite of corporate America. Let me come back to that. So I'm the general counsel of Xerox. I'm the first general counsel ever hired directly from the outside by Xerox. In the long history of Xerox, there's never been somebody who was brought in from outside. I, I met, now, some of you may say, what the hell does general counsel do? I'll explain. General counsel is the highest ranking lawyer for the company. I report directly to the CEO, and I'm one of the seven most senior executives in the company. In my case, I manage 150 lawyers worldwide, and I have non-legal staff of another 150, so I manage about 300 people. We're in 160 different countries, and I have lawyers in many of those countries. Now, before you assume what Xerox is, most of you probably know Xerox as a copier company. That's about 20% of the revenues today. Let me give you a little bit more of an idea what Xerox really is. You know who, what EasyPass is? That's us. We manage all of EasyPass for the state of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, etc., most of the East Coast. We also uh, do Medicare and Medicaid payments. So if you, have, if you receive payments from Medicare and Medicaid, that's us. We're also the largest administrator of student loans. So if you have student loans, chances are we're sending you the bill. <laughs> I, was, uh, I got a $100 bill because I went through EasyPass without a uh, transponder. And my father at that time said, well, you were a senior guy at Xerox, why do you have to pay this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that senior. Um, it's a challenging job, but it's a very fun job. It's the best job I've ever had. And I wouldn't trade my job for any other job. And I do get a lot of recruiters who still call me to ask me if I want to go somewhere else. And I have no interest in going anywhere else. It's the most awesome job I've ever had. So, outside of my office, I am also very busy. This is one of the things I do. I have three things that I do outside of my office that is passion to me. Somebody asked me earlier, if I had to go to do it again, would I go to law school? And I would say, yes, I would. I would go back to law school because the things that I do outside the office, I can only do right now 
with the law degree. So let me give you some of the things I do. I do a lot of mentoring. Um, I have any given moment 10 mentees on my list. And a lot of those are young Asian law students, young lawyers, and some of them are even actually fairly senior lawyers who are looking for a job just like mine. So I advise them on how to develop their career. That takes a lot of time, but it's a lot of fun. Second thing that I do, um, I believe the practice of law should be more diverse, meaning minorities and women should be more participating in the practice of law. So I do a lot of things to diversify the practice of law. I was, until recently, the chairman of an organization called Minority Corporate Council Association, which is an association that was created essentially to diversify the practice of law as we know it. The third thing that I do, which is probably the area that I spend most of my time on, is to focus on Asian American issues. What are Asian American issues? Asian Americans have a number of things that we have done extremely well. We have sent more kids than any other minorities to top colleges, Ivy Leagues, and so forth. Yet, we are actually misnomered as the model minority. The implication of the model minority is that somehow we're more successful than other minorities, and it's not true. The reality is actually, in corporate America, you almost see no Asians. Name me one Asian, uh, Asian American CEO of the Fortune 500. Interesting. There are some, you just don't know it. There are very few top managers in the practice of law. And there are very few Asian Americans in virtually everything that you see. Not at the federal government, not at the state government, not even NGOs. Thus, the notion of breaking the bamboo ceiling is a very tough thing to do in corporate America. Remember the story I told you about the colleague who said Asian Americans are smart? The problem is that the Asian Americans have a stereotype that says you're smart, but you're, you're very boring, you're not a leader, not charismatic, not funny, none of which make a good leader. What you need in an organization to be a leader are the following characteristics, bold, Creative, assertive, aggressive, risk-taking, charismatic. Those are the qualities you want. They're not necessarily related to how smart you are. Let me summarize. It's not about IQ. It's about EQ that makes you a charismatic leader. So in other words, I had a stereotype that said I had a high IQ but low EQ. Um, let me tell you what that means in real life. About 10 years ago, I started tracking something that is now formalized. I started tracking how many of the Asian American lawyers become partners at big firms. At, at large law firms, the partners essentially own the firm and the associates essentially are low-level employees. And we talked about Fox Rothschild, Fox Rothschild is the same way. Uh, Wama was a partner, but there are many, many associates who are not partners. So I, when I started tracking how many Asian Americans become associates with a partner, the number was six to one. Every six Asian American associates became partners. You know what the majority is? If you're white, it's four to one. If you're African American, it's five to one. If you're Hispanic, you're three to one. Which means if you're Asian American, you're the worst odds in the house. Today, it's eight to one our odds became worse. So back 10 years ago when I started tracking, people said, well, maybe it's time issue. Maybe if we just, since we're the most recent immigrants, we will get better as time goes on. And 10 years later, we've gotten worse. So why is that? Now, before you assume that Asian Americans are lousy in the practice of law, law only, that's not true. Same way in corporate America. There are 9% of all professionals in Fortune 500 who are Asian Americans? Doctors, lawyers, accountants, you name it. Only less than 1% are corporate officers. Remember the 8 to 1 odds? It's 9 to 1 odds that you'll be a corporate officer if you're Asian American. It's still the worst odds in the house. So, what's the problem? 
Why is it that we have such lousy uh, succession rate? I have a hypothesis, and there are now studies that have recently come out from Harvard, University of Toronto, that actually have started confirming some of my, uh, my hypothesis that I've had for the last 12 years. It goes something like this. In the pursuit of academic achievement, an entrance to a top college, is it possible that a lot of Asian American parents forget to build a foundation for success within their kids before college so that after college they can succeed? That's the hypothesis. Okay? So success in academics, whether you like it or not, has no correlation to what you become later on. Well, most of the Fortune 500 CEOs are not Ivy League grads. The University of Wisconsin grads, Purdue grads, Oklahoma grads. There are some Harvard grads, not as many, many as you think. See, to succeed in corporate America, in addition to academics, you've got to develop the following skills, which are not IQ issues, but EQ issues. It's communication skills, people skills, leadership skills. Those are the skills you need to succeed in most professional lives. Practice of law, like anything else, is a service business. You have to make your clients like you. I was telling you earlier, a partner is engaged in salesmanship. That requires people skills. Academic skills become secondary at that point. So key to professional or corporate life is essentially honing the art of people skills, leadership skills. Something that, frankly, my parents really did not have an opportunity to teach me, and a lot of Asian American families do not value that as an important skill when they teach their kids. It's all about straight A's, it's all about music, etc. Which are, by the way, extremely lonely activities. Try studying with 100 other kids, it's really hard. You have to study by yourself. If you want to play music, you're by yourself. Right? Remember the Tiger Mom book? Amy Choi is a very good friend of mine. My kids go to the same school as our kids. I disagree with her. Studying well, doing music well, is contrary to the ultimate skills that are needed to succeed in corporate America, which are people skills. That means you have to go to parties. My kids go to a lot of parties. You know why? And I heard you speak. You told me to go to parties, so I'm going to parties. I let him go. So, if you are already an Asian American who's graduated from college, what should you do? Most of you seem like you've graduated from college. Where should, where should your time be spent? So I got four recommendations. First, network, network, network. Most people would chill that have my Rolodex. It is some of the most important things I own. It's the people I've, did, I've got to know who are in a position of power to judge me and to say something nice about me and to be able to promote my name. That's what networking gives you. It takes people skills to network, but it's a very important part of your overall success. The second thing I, you should do, you need to learn how to communicate effectively. I used to be a terrible public speaker. Um, I, I used to stand up here and sweat like crazy. I remember my first public speaking engagement. I think I lost about 50 pounds that day. I was so scared and sweating so much because of nervousness. Now I do these speeches three, four times a month and I don't even practice. I just get up here and I got a few notes and I'll just speak. So as bad as I was, you can get better at it. It's just a matter of practice. So people skills, communication skills, leadership skills like academics can be taught. It's a matter of practice. The third thing, I mentioned it earlier. Mentoring is an incredibly important thing. Go find a mentor. I don't care how old you are, everybody needs a mentor. 
Everybody needs a mentee. Because to teach somebody how to, uh, how to do something well requires you to be, as a mentor, to hone your own skills. Because you can't teach somebody what you don't know. So mentoring itself is a wonderful skill. But if you're a, me if you're a mentee, you benefit from the mentor. So I, I'm a true believer in mentoring. A final uh, point, and it's primarily for younger folks than your average age here. The fourth advice and the final advice is chart your own course. Don't let somebody else tell you you have to go to Penn because that's the school you, your parents want you to go to. Don't let your uh, parents' friends, which is really what happened when I went to law school, you're an Asian, you can't be a lawyer. Nobody's going to hire an Asian lawyer. Don't go to law school, was the advice I got. I went to law school anyway. And somebody said, you can't be a Wall Street lawyer as an Asian American. That's ridiculous. Nobody's going to accept you. I became a mergers and acquisition lawyer. So my advice to the young people is do not let somebody else tell you what you should do. Chart your own course. Be passionate about something and just go do it. <laughs>